Welcome. There we go. Welcome to a Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Live from the St. Francis Yacht Club. We're looking out the window at our, as usual, beautiful San Francisco Bay. The clouds just lifted, the fog just lifted above the midsection of the bay, so we get a pretty good view of the bottom of the bay. And our Okay, we're cutting to a camera that shows the bay right now. I'm going to say it's blowing about 16 knots out there. We are the envy of the rest of the yachting world because we've got a close, immediate view of the water, and there's something going on in the water all the time. Let's see a little bit about future speakers. You want to come by during the Big Boat series because none other than Daniel Forrester, the world-renowned yachting photographer, will be here to talk to us all about beauty in the heart of the beast. He goes, as you know, right underneath the fastest racing yachts in the world and takes incredibly beautiful pictures with him. People are always wondering why he doesn't get run over. He'll tell us why. And then on September the 5th, uh, Rich Jeppesen, co-founder of the Olympic Circle Rail Sailing School, Olympic Circle Sailing School, he'll be here to talk all about making a living doing what you love. He will make the case that uh, sailing is good for you and having a business that takes and introduces people to sailing is a service to all of mankind. I would agree. Uh, and then on uh, August the 15th, um, we'll be listening to um, the new world of hybrid powerboats. In fact, um, zero emission uh, boats are growing in the ocean at about the rate that electric vehicles were, you know, like six, eight years ago. And Joe Pratt, who has Golden Gate Zero Emission Marine, there's a name for you, Golden Gate Zero Emission Marine, he will make the case that zero emissions are very much, very important for um, uh, aquatic activities because um, not only do internal combustion engines uh, pollute the oceans, but they also create sound pollution that we've heard about on this stage before, and that's not healthy for the animals that are in the ocean. A little bit about our speaker today. You've probably heard Michael Ellis, maybe even seen him on television because he's a renowned naturalist, and he helps bring the world of the outdoors and the native environment to uh, otherwise city folks. And um, he started doing this as a, as a youngster, but first of all, you got to recognize that this person who's taken uh, folks on trips all around the world started in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, the uh, very site of, in, and he, his first time on a sailboat was on um, Norris Lake. Who knows the significance of Norris Lake? The Tennessee Valley Authority, this work make work project after the depression started there it was the first major project there and he went sailing on that in the when when fishing there on uh, for walleye fish with his dad in a little speedboat, a little fishing boat, a Johnson Powered fishing boat. And then in 1971, he found himself sailing around in an El Toro-like small boat on that lake with a broken leg that he'd gotten from parachuting. You know, he's an adventurist if he's been parachuting at that early age. And a broomstick for a paddle. Had he really had troubles, we wouldn't be here to speak to us today. In 74, he took a big ship trip from Dakar, Senegal to Marseille, France, and those of us who sail in the ocean, oh, that's a trek. That's a bit of a trek. He later on would get a BS in botany from the University of Tennessee, and then years later, a Master of Science in Marine Biology from my own alma mater, San Francisco State. And then in 1982, he took his first city folks trip. That is to say, he took folks on his first, what we now call, what he calls, footloose forays down to Baja, California, in a, in a ship, in a boat, a big offshore fishing boat. Since then, he's taken 1,000 plus footloose forays and brought people uh, to incredible, wonderful trips from Northern California to Madagascar. That's as far around the earth as you can get without starting to get closer to San Francisco. Please welcome the renowned naturalist, Oh, 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 we should, we should also ask the first female Commodore in the history of the St. Francis Yacht Club, our wonderful Teresa Brander, to come up and, and smile, give us a welcome, uh, Teresa. Why, thank you, Ron. Um, I must be somewhat forgettable because you <laughs> seem to last <laughs> your time. Anyway, I'll have to do something more noteworthy to be remembered. Anyway, so um, welcome everyone, uh, members, guests here in the room at the Yacht Club and also those who are tuning in online. We love having your 
you as an audience and um, the attention uh, that we, we love to give to various topics, sailing otherwise. But this is going to be an interesting one today. So really looking forward to uh, welcome, welcoming Michael Ellis and um, welcoming all of you to watch, um, watch our presentation today. Thank you. Thank you, Commodore. And so uh, with that welcome, the noted naturalist, Michael Ellis. Michael. Well, it's really happy to be here. I think I've been here on three or four other occasions talking about different things. But um, today we're going to talk about Tanzania, which is a place uh, dear to my heart. In uh, 1974, actually it was 73, I tried to get to East Africa, but the Arab-Israeli war broke out. It was so inconvenient, so we had to backpedal a little bit. But I got there finally in 1992, and essentially every February since then I've led trips to Africa, and my point is that if you like the wild things on the planet, um, Africa, especially East Africa, especially Tanzania, is the place to go. Uh, and I've been leading trips there forever, and I kept looking at this mountain, of course, Mount Kilimanjaro. And finally I thought, you know, I need to climb that mountain, you know, because I'd seen it. And uh, so in 2010, I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. Give me a round of applause, please. Okay. But even more importantly than that, I took my hula hoop on top of Mount Kilimanjaro, and I hula hooped on top of Kilimanjaro. When I got back, I called, uh, you know, contacted Guinness Book of Records, and they said that was really good. Give me a round of applause. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so I contacted Guinness Book of Records and I told them what they had done, and they said that's really nice, but you didn't pay the money that you need to pay us to get, a, you know, a, the official title. However, I'm pretty sure it was the highest hula hooping to that point at that time. Um, anyway, so what I'd like to do is to go through. Are we ready? I think we are. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to go through a few slides, and basically what we're going to do is kind of follow uh, the normal trip that I do. Um, and this is uh, the spotted hyena. I'll talk about it a little bit later, but it's the Rodney Dangerfield of predators. It's the one that gets no respect. Um, and, and actually, when you get to know these animals, you realize that these are really cool. They're the super predators of Africa. And uh, they actually, um, lions steal more food from hyenas than hyenas steal from lions. If you don't remember anything else, you know, lions got the king of the jungle kind of idea, but the hyenas are the really super predators of Africa. Um, okay, that's not working. Okay, let's see here. We're really close to the hyena. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was, and I was much smaller then, too, you might have noticed. Um, I just wanted to point out, um, Africa is a huge continent. It's one-fifth of the world's land mass is in the continent of Africa. Most people have no idea how big it is. You could put the continental United States inside the Sahara Desert. Okay, that's how big Africa is. Most people say, so how is Africa? You know, it's like, well, <laughs> okay, North Africa, South Africa, East Africa, West Africa, which Africa are you talking about? We're talking about Tanzania. Tanzania um, was German East Africa. Um, then they lost the First Great War. It became Tanganyika, owned by the British. Um, in 1964, um, the island of Zanzibar and the uh, landmass of Tanganyika joined created a new country called Tanzania. Tanzania is twice as big as um, California. It's a big place. And how many of you have been to Tanzania on safari? I was afraid of that. <laughs> That's good. Um, and where we're spending most of the time is in the northern part, what they call the northern safari circuit. That's where I tend to go all the time. Um, we land in the, in the town of Arusha, which you can see right there. Um, Oh, I, I need to have a caveat. I had a slideshow that I already made years ago, and I was all ready to check it out, and I, it, it's lost. You know Etch-a-Sketches? You guys remember Etch-a-Sketches? That's what I think of computers as. It's Etch-a-Sketch, and somehow I dropped the computer, and the Etch-a-Sketch etch of my Tanzania slideshow disappeared. So I put this together this morning. I got up nice and early, so it's not as 
uh, I'm, I hate people when make excuses for things. I'm one of them. Anyway, this is Mount Kilimanjaro, 19,460 feet high. Um, and then when we wake up in the morning, I, I take people to a lodge that is a little bit funky. And I try to really – so. but when they wake up, they land in Tanzania. They get transported under cover of darkness. When they wake up in the morning, they look and they see Mount Kilimanjaro, and they look to the other direction and see Mount Meru, the, si the seventh highest peak in Africa, and they get the opportunity to see giraffes, maybe even the whole animal, not just the legs. Um, so when they wake up in the morning, they understand that they're in Africa. And so one of the important components of my trips is that I uh, really think about trip choreography, that is how a trip unfolds, okay? Any uh, psychiatrist or psychologist or therapist in the room? One. She's afraid. You see how she barely put her hand up, okay? <laughs> peak experience. There's a psychological term called peak experience, which means no matter how bad the beginning of the trip was, you really want it to end on a high note because then they'll forget the end. So Momella Lodge, where I stay, they wake up, they see Kilimanjaro, they see Mount Meru, they forget about the funkiness of the room, and then the national animal of Tanzania is waiting for them outside, which is the Twiga or the giraffe right here. This is a tiny park. Um, it doesn't have a lot of the kind of charismatic organisms that exist in other places, but it's nevertheless a really sweet place. And giraffes are what uh, one of the um, – they're, they're, he called it socially schizophrenic, which is in not a really good term. But you hardly ever see a giraffe by itself. Um, I've had the good fortune to witness one birth. Um, some of you, um, a lot of you, I'm sure, have given birth, and you know you slap the babies on the back to get them to cry. But if you drop eight feet, <laughs> you don't have to slap the baby. So the mothers do not settle down to birth. They, they are standing up, and so when the baby drops, it's like, whoa, okay, I'm here on the planet. All righty then. Whoa. I only have one, a one birth per year. They're, they're, they're not very fecund, um, but they are widespread. Um, there's eight races of giraffes. This particular one happens to be called the Maasai giraffe. Um, but the one place, uh, by the way, I forgot to mention, the place that we're traveling right now is Arusha National Park, which is right outside the town of Arusha. And it's got Mount Meru, that mountain that you saw, which, by the way, that, that mountain is as high as uh, Mount Whitney, that mountain. Um, and then the one place that we get to see this particular animal is this is called a colobus monkey, black and white colobus monkey. And colobus is the Greek word that means maimed. And the reason it, it's called maimed is because it has a highly modif uh, modified or absent thumb, so they call them maimed. So this, this primate, which is one of our close relatives, would not be designing computers. Um, they are kind of kind of cool looking, actually. They look. This one looks a little bit like Richard Nixon. Can you see the little nose right there? Okay. Um, these are some of you. I mean, I, I know we have a lot of experienced travelers in the room, and a lot of you have probably been to the. Um, uh, neotropics and seen the howler monkeys, right? How many of you have seen howler monkeys or heard the howler monkeys? Okay, a lot of you have. Those are animals that are the ecological equivalents of the colobus monkeys. What do I mean by that? What, what I mean by that is that these are two organisms that have adapted to basically eating nothing but leaves. So what does that mean? That means they means they fart a lot, um, but also that they have a very uh, slow digestive rate. They basically stay in the tops of the trees and don't move very much, um, and they're unrelated to each other. I should – yeah. Monkeys, by the way, evolved in Asia and Africa, and 40 million years ago, there was a vegetation mass – nobody knows how big it was or the circumstances – that actually um, monkeys from Africa rafted across to South America, and that's how they got there. And so the monkeys that we have in the neotropics all evolved from monkeys that actually rafted over from Africa. Now, 40 million years ago, Africa and South America were a little bit closer than they are today. Okay? But all the monkeys that we have in the New World came from the monkeys in the Old World. Uh, this is a monkey. Uh, it's kind of cute here. Uh, this is a, uh, a blue monkey. It's a genus called Circopithecus. Some of you know the green monkey virus. Um, you know, perhaps this is the monkeys that might have uh, harbored the AIDS uh, virus that leaped from uh, primates to human beings in the bushmeat trade. And this is a, a really cute guy with really nice eyes, this guy. And none of the monkeys in the New World have uh, – excuse me, in the Old World have a prehensile tail. They can't really use their tails to, um, to, to find their way through the environment. 
This is a, a little antelope that we have called the Dick Dick. Okay, they don't let, don't ever call them little Dick Dicks. Okay, they hate that. Okay, <laughs> just just use do not use that adjective around them. Just call them Dick Dicks. Okay, and they have uh, these are like in the cute scale, maybe nine point eight. Five on the cute scale, something like that. And they have these really cool little glands. If you look at their, their eyeballs, you can see these little dark um, shape right there. And mammals, of course, uh, their primary form of communication is through odor. Um, and so what, they, what these guys do is they mark uh, their territory with these little glands. They put these little packages, if you will, of little black sticky stuff that de describes their territory. Human beings like this animal because it's monogamous, okay? Um, human beings think, we're monogamous. <laughs> Wrong! Um, and so... These little animals will stay together in a monogamous pair, um, define their territory in a very tiny area, and if there's a conflict, this is so cool what they do, they have something called air pillow cushion battles. Okay, did I get that right? Air pillow cushion cushion cushion. So two males will come up to the edge of their territory, and they'll do this. They won't hit. And it reminds me of a bunch of little kids. I got you first. No, you didn't. Yeah, but one of them gives up, actually. And I've only seen that one time. So um, anyway, these are, what, were, what are these called? Okay, just checking. Uh, when I do my trips, uh, there's a number of different kinds of accommodations that I use. Um, I, I, as I said, um, I kind of try to mix it up. And this is a place called Terengiri. How many of you been to Terengiri? Anybody been to Terengiri? Okay. Um, this is, uh, these are what we call permanent tented camps, um, and they're extremely comfortable. They have in-suite bathrooms, showers, solar hot water. Nevertheless, there's a, a very hmm, – uh, feels very connected to the environment. You know, there's not a lot of barriers between you and what's going on out there. Um, and this is the this is my tent on the end because I know Jonathan and Annette who own this. They always I always request this tent right here, number ten, and so they give it to me. So this is what I look out on from my from my little comfortable little tent. This is the Terengiri River. Now the next slide is going to show you how um, you know Africa or at least Tanzania, is south of the equator. That's my excuse for this slide. I, try, I tried to get this slide to go different ways, and it hasn't, hadn't wanted to go any way but this way right here. Um, but you see this little tiny river. What I'm pointing out here is the quality of water that's in this river at this point. And then look at the amount of water in the same river this year. And then look at the amount of water in that year. And so in Tanzania, like a lot of East Africa, they have what's called a bimodal rainy system, which means there's a period of short rains followed by a period of long rains. And not unlike our environment here in California, there's, you know, the, the, the climate and then there's weather. And so periodically um, it changes a, ho a whole lot. And you can see this year uh, the river was so big we couldn't even cross the river right here. And I love the, the name Terengiri. Um, Ingiri is the Kiswahili word that means warthog. Terra means river. So this is called the river of warthogs. Okay, there aren't any warthogs along this river in this picture, but that's what the river is called. A lot of the place in East Africa has what we call internal drainage. And what I mean by that is the earth has stretched and thinned and dropped. And like the great basin um, in east of the Sierra Nevada through most of Nevada, eastern Washington and Oregon, there's interior drainages because the earth has, has stretched apart the great uh, African Rift Valley I'm sure you all have heard of. It's created these down uh, blocked valleys called grabens, which is the German word that either means ditch or grave. Um, and so all the in drainage is interior. So even though this has a lot of water in it, it's going to an interior drainage. And that's true of most of East Africa as well as it is Mono Lake, Great Salt Lake, and places in California. Terengiri is famous as, besides Botswana, as the greatest last repository of African elephants. There is so much to say about African elephants. I don't even know where to begin. Uh, but once you understand the social relationships that elephants have, it's unimaginable that human beings could kill these animals. And then the next part of the thinking process is, 
yeah, but we kill each other too. <laughs> so that's not so unimaginable. And I was trying to decide what aspect of elephant social structure or physiology or evolution I should talk about. And I think it's probably um, menopause. Okay. How many of you? No, no, I'm not going to ask. <laughs> How many of you are not? <laughs> no, uh, that would be fewer hands. Um, so there's only a handful of animals, mammals on the planet Earth that continue to breed past. Excuse me. Continue to live past reproductive ability. Okay. They are African elephants, short-finned pilot whales, killer whales, orcas. And African elephants. Okay, so what's the common denominator that links these animals together, these mammals together, uh, that allows them to continue? And what's the importance from an evolutionary point of view of, uh, and I'll switch the picture because this has to do with that little guy right there. Um, and also, um, I was told that eight seconds on each slide is enough because then you guys start fading out and stuff and then I'll probably say something like sex and then get your attention again. Um, the, um, uh, basically, in all cases, it's a matriarchal society. What I mean by that is the older females have information, knowledge that is essential to the survival of the group. So these are all very social animals, all the ones that I mentioned. Uh, female grandmothers, for example, when they've done studies on hunter-gatherer tribes, like the guys go out and every once in a while kill some kind of meat, okay? But the one that's actually securing the nutrients on a daily basis is grandmother. The, the grandmother of human beings that is also knows the – has is the repository of the knowledge about um, – what herbs are, are, are good, you know, how to secure, how to cure somebody when they're sick, you know. So they continue to live past the ability to give birth because the information and knowledge that they have is so essential to their own offspring's offspring, okay? Uh, the same is true with uh, 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 the, the coastal variety um, of the killer whales. It, the, as you know, it's kind of like Italians. Um, the males never leave their mothers. <laughs> Sorry if any of you are Italians. Um, but, and also um, the same is true with short-finned pilot whales. And with African elephants, uh, the longest relationship outside of human beings in terms of a, a family connection is the very first female which is born in the group with to the mother that's the the patriarch that relationship she will never leave the group and that relationship will span 40 or 50 years essentially so the fem the first born female will, will stay with his mother her mother for that entire time now in Terengiri do I have another picture of elephants yes in Ter just so I can you know move along there um, so you can look at the elephant butts for a while while I'm finishing this story um, <laughs> So in African elephants, for example, in Terengiri was a classic example. During the 1980s, elephants were extremely persecuted. Uh, they, 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 they went from 1.9 million at the beginning of the 1980s to 400,000 at the end. It was the greatest mammalian slaughter on the history of the planet Earth, except for here in North America when we killed 40 million bison, but we won't go there. Um, essentially what happened then, to cut to the chase, is some of the animals that were able to survive during this severe drought that occurred in 19. 92 had older females in the group that were able to remember the previous drought in 1958, take the group outside of the park, take them to where the water was still and the forage was still available, survive, and then come back in. The animals, the groups, the family groups that had the young, inexperienced females stayed in the park because they didn't have this knowledge and actually suffered and lost a lot of young. So it was kind of, unfortunately, a classic experiment that demonstrated the value of living past reproductive age. Okay, now we'll move on to... Okay, believe it or not, anybody know what this guy is? Looks like a what? Chipmunk, a rat. <laughs> believe it or not, this is the closest living relative to elephants. This is called a hyrax. Did somebody say hyrax? I said hyrax. You said hyrax? Yeah. Sylvia, how'd you know it was a hyrax? Uh, you said the closest living relative to elephants, so I knew it was a hyrax. <laughs> All right, she's clearly raising the class average. 
<laughs> I hated people like that when I was in school. <laughs> yes, this is a little uh, rodent-looking thing that's about this big. It's got a physical uh, similarities in terms of the, the placenta development, the hooves, the arrangement. And the Maasai, interestingly enough, said that when the Great Spirit made um, the world, he made a large one and he made a small one of everything. So he made a large elephant and he made a hyrax. Okay, And so the hyraxes complained that they kept walking around and stepping on their trunks. So the great ones chopped off the trunk and said, okay, well, here you go. And so anyway, the Maasai noticed when they de uh, dissected these guys that they had the same pl placenta arrangement as, as elephants. Anyway, this is – and these are only about this big. In the Bible, they're called coonies, C-O-N-I-E-S, something like that. Anyway, uh, yeah, don't feed the animals. Um, here's – Here's somebody currying favor. I love these expressions that we use, in, you know. And I, I often tell people, what do you think humans ate first, lice or rice? <laughs> so one of the ways that we, you know, reinforce a social relationships is to preen. These are baboons. These, this is called the savanna baboon. Uh, are this, uh, this is kind of a goofy – it does look like a, like a goofy teenager that doesn't really know what's happening right now. Maybe it was its first dance at the sock hop. Um, yeah, th so these are the savanna baboons, very aggressive animals, very successful. Uh, they're one of the few primates that has moved down out of the trees and moved out into the grassland. Can you name another primate that's done that? Human. Yeah, there you go, good. Um, and also um, lowland gorillas as well and mountain gorillas. But most of the primates, most of our, our ancestors, our relatives live up in the trees except for these guys. Um, and they, um, they eat grass mostly. Who else? What other primate eats mostly grass? Us. How much grass do you – I mean, 70 percent of the world eats rice. It's a kind of grass. How many of you had pasta tonight? I mean, this afternoon. That was grass as well. So what these guys do is mostly eat grass. But they're omnivorous as well. You know, they'll go and they'll eat the opportunistic feeders. You know, they're very successful. And I remember one time being in Botswana, and they said, you and your wife are going to have to have tent number three. I went, oh, yeah, no problem. You'll see. <laughs> So what happens is the baboons kind of did a circuit, you know, the whole group. By the way, the groups can be – they're called troops or – I love this – Congress. Uh, Congress of baboons. How many – we have one of those. Okay. Um, oh, we're not supposed to do politics here? Okay, sorry. Um, anyway, so <laughs> that night I understood why tent number three was uh, qualified. The entire 90 – baboons gathered above our tent and all night long rained urine and poop on our tent because I was the tour guide. I got tent number three. Um, and that's what they do. They move through the environment. They don't really have territories per se. When they get close to another group, they just kind of work it out and then they move away. So baboons. Uh, and I had the good fortune of seeing this uh, albino baboon. Uh, which is very unusual. This is in Arusha National Park, and so I managed to get a picture of this albino baboon. And I saw him five or six years ago when he was a little guy, and he's clearly – he was dominant. He was, so they're either colorblind or they don't care because he was clearly accepted into the group, and so there wasn't any, um, anything that appeared to be uh, prejudiced against this animal, which was kind of cool. Uh, now we have the – this is the uh, black-faced vervet monkey. Um, this one, you can see – this is a male. How did you know that? <laughs> um, and this one's making sure the ingredients are properly in the, in the food that he managed to secure, you know, me measuring the ingredients. I, kn I know it's upside down. Okay. But I was hoping that you – know. this is the, a relative like the um, blue monkey that we saw earlier with the close-up cute face. Um, these are the commonest genus, Cercopithecus, and this is the black-faced vervet monkey. Or if you've heard of green monkey virus, this is the monkey that has that right there. And unfortunately, it transferred from people, we think, because of bushmeat trade. Exactly. And you have to be really careful with these guys. They can be quite aggressive. I had one charge me one time, and I had a camera with a Canon lens at the time, and I swung the lens that had hit him in the nose, and he – you know, he went away, and the lens was broken. It was one of these uh, old Canon lenses, you know, years ago. And so I, I took a picture, and I called it Evil Monkey. I sent it into Canon. I said, you know, look, I saved you, – you know, the Canon lens saved my life. I could have been bitten by this monkey. You know, can you fix this? And they went back, oh, great story. Sorry, that will be $400. <laughs> I was like, Dad, no, that didn't work. Um, and, you know, one of the things that surprises people when they go to um, – oh, my God – when they go to um, Tanzania is the bird life. You haven't been a birder 
But then all of a sudden, oh my God, the birds are so easy to see. They're big and they're showy and they're great. This is a tawny eagle, uh, which is the commonest one. And here we have a kill. Everybody likes to see kills. And then we have, this is the lappet-faced or Nubian vulture. This bird has the biggest and strongest beak of any animal, uh, uh, any bird at any rate. And this is the can opener. If there's an animal that dies, a carcass that is really hard to open because the skin is so hard, all the other vultures have to wait around. Can't get in there. They get in the anus and through the eyeballs, okay, which makes for lots of comments and, you know, interesting videos. Um, but this guy is the only one that can actually rip open the skin of some of the predators. Their kingfishers there are very weird. They're brightly colored, and they don't eat fish. Um, they eat insects, and they're called, this one's called the woodland kingfisher, and it eats insects. So instead of diving on fish, it's diving on grasshoppers. Same is true with this gray-headed kingfisher. This is the national bird of Uganda. This is called the gray-crowned crane. For many people, this is their favorite bird in Africa for a num number of reasons. One is it's quite colorful. Two is it, it can be close to the car. Uh, and three is it's large. And, and maybe four, they can remember the name. Uh, Impalas, Chevrolets. You can, here's a male right here. Um, with his harem, and I usually word that, use that word loosely, harem, because that connotes male control of females. Um, and actually, the females often have what we call female choice. They can move from group to group. In this case, this is actually a harem. He does try to control the females. Uh, these are the most elegant of all the antelopes. Uh, saddle, uh, yellow-billed storks. God, I don't know why they call them that. They're pretty cute. Uh, and this is a secretary bird. Uh, this is kind of a charismatic species. And they thought it was called a secretary bird because of these quills that you see. This is, a, by the way, related to falcons. This is a bird of prey that's on the ground. The scientific name is Sagitta serpentarius. Sagitta means the archer. Serpentarius is snake. It's the archer of snakes. And so it hunts on the ground by uh, scaring snakes and then killing them. Okay. Um, this is, oh, I just wanted to bring this slide. Can you see the weird looking feet yeah. right there? So actually, when you see a bird, uh, some of you go, wow, his knees are backwards. Okay. Actually, that's the ankle that you see right there. His knees are up hidden into the feathers right here. So I just put that one in. That's called the saddle build story. Okay. At Burning Man, how many of you have been to Burning Man? I knew that that was going to be the, my friend David over there. <laughs> exactly. So at Burning Man, you, we have alternative names, okay, uh, in case somebody recognizes you. <laughs> so my alternative name is the name for this lizard in Africa, which is called the Agama lizard. So, you know, I often wear blue with pink outfits, so that's why I put this slide in here. Okay, here's another carnivore, another predator. This one is called the dwarf mongoose. This found, is found in huge groups, and its claim to fame biologically is the dominant alpha pair, the female, the female somehow in the group of maybe 15 or 20 individuals is able to suppress ovulation in the other females chemically. Like, no, 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 you're not going to do that. Okay. Um, and so all of the group kind of like wolves, they um, help the alpha pair raise the young. Okay. If one of them happens, one of the subordinate females happens to get pregnant, she'll kill the baby. Okay, they're tough. Okay. There was a rough transition. <laughs> okay, now finally we're at the Serengeti. Okay, and the Serengeti is basically these, uh, the size of the country of Switzerland. It's an ecosystem. It includes a little bit of, of Kenya, but the majority of it is in, um, is in Tanzania. Uh, there's some protected lands, depending on, um, you know, designation. There's a national park, Serengeti National Park. There's what's called the Ngorogoro Conservation Area. And there's game reserve places as well. Um, and so, but all of this, the idea is to protect the wildebeest as they migrate in their yearly annual search for food and breeding opportunities. And so this is just um, sort of an illustration of that. And... Uh, I didn't make this picture up. I mean, this is what happens sometimes. You see literally tens of thousands. And what I tell people is, you want to see what the Pleistocene era of, uh, of, the, of North America or of the world looked like uh, 15,000 years ago? Go to East Africa in February. All the animals are massed in the short grass plains in, in February, and it's just phenomenal. I mean, there's nothing quite like it left. Um, so the wildebeest, um, uh, also known as white-bearded news, um, which is their common name. There's probably 1.6 million of these. And some of you are wondering about the 
changes that have occurred through time in Africa. And, well, you know, like when I first went to Africa in 73, you know what, there were, what, five and a half billion people on the planet Earth. Now there's seven billion people. So the pre population pressures have changed. But there's some good news. The wildebeest are in greater numbers than they've ever been right now. You know, so the ecosystem in the Serengeti is more or less pretty well protected, which is good news. And the whole reason that I go in February is because they're all gathering on the short grass plain because it's the, the grass there, I won't go into the details of why, but the grass there is, is full of calcium. Calcium is absolutely essential for the production of milk. And so that's why they come down to give birth to these little babies. You can see the baby on the right-hand side in this picture right here. Uh, that baby was just born seconds ago. Uh, within Sometimes an average of, believe it or not, four minutes, that baby is up on its feet and ready to roll, okay? How many of you have kids that have moved back in in their 30s to your house? <laughs> All righty then. Uh, you, know, you know, there's a certain advantage. And then they're ready to roll, these cute little guys. They're brown and, and wildebeest. And you know where I got all this information was in the newspaper. Okay, I've got a lot of really bad news jokes, but I'm not going to uh, burn you with them. There are four animals. This will be on the quiz. There are four animals that do this migration, okay, this circular migration. One is, of course, the wildebeest, which I just mentioned. And then there's the plain zebra, the brutal zebra, this one right here. Then, oh, that's a tail of a zebra, duh. Um, then there is this little guy right here, which is called the Thompson's gazelle, actually. And here is the, um, the large, this is called an eland, Okay, and this is the fourth animal that migrate together. So by far the, 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 uh, the uh, wildebeest gets most of the press, but all four of these animals are migrating together. Uh, this is kind of the Serengeti, what it looks like. It's got these little outcroppings called kopjes, which is the Afrikaan or Dutch word that means little head. Um, they're little ex, ex, they look a lot like uh, Sierra Nevada exfoliating granite or Joshua Tree National Monument or if you've been to Rio, those big peaks. And so they just sit, sit out in the middle of this grassy plain, essentially, which is what Serengeti literally means is endless plain or grassy plain. And this is, I have a camp set up specifically for us. Um, so this is a camp at Moro Copies number three, to be exact. And uh, behind this tent that you can see, there's an outcropping. And that's where I've instructed my son, and I've provided funds for this. My ashes are going to be scattered right there. Uh, because everywhere, uh, when people go back to East Africa, what they sometimes only get sort of somatically or through their heart is, wow, I'm really comfortable here. And in every sense of the word, when you go to East Africa, you are going home, actually. It's where every human being originated from. So the landscape is extremely comfortable in spite of the fact that there's predators about to jump on you and kill you. Um, <laughs> and this is what everybody wants to see. This is a, this is a leopard right here. So far, where's, this is wood. Thank you. I have never not seen leopards on any of the gazillion safaris I've done to Africa. Um, and these are really remarkable animals. They, their biological claim to fame is they have the greatest uh, longitudinal range of any land mammal on the planet Earth. What do I mean by that? Leopards are found from Africa all the way across the Near East, the Middle East, India, all the way to Korea. Okay, they can go up to huge high elevations or down to below sea level. Okay, extremely adaptable animals because they can feed on dung beetles or they can eat the German Shepherd right off your porch. And they can be very um, discreet, shall we say. Okay, leopards. Everybody wants to see them. Key Swahili word is chewy. Okay, and there's two in the tree. Guess what they're doing? You never see a leopard by itself. Um, I mean, you always see a leopard by itself unless mating is happening. So that's what we happen to see these guys um, uh, have a little fun. And these are the most beautiful of all the cats. Uh, the uh, feline embodiment of beauty, stealth, and strength is how they've been described. I love leopards. And most of the time they hunt at night. They're ambush predators. It's very rare. When we do see them, we see them in the daytime. Um, there's one. Okay. Oh, yeah, and these guys, okay, uh, the king of the beasts, okay, uh, this guy, <laughs> I had a really bad night last night, but <laughs> how many of you have felt like that before? I'm going to drink, this is a gin and tonic, it's medicinal, I figured I was, you know, I was in malaria slideshow country, so... <laughs> Anyway, everybody wants to see lions, of course. Whenever you see two of these together, um, that means they're also courting or mating. Uh, by the way, you see how dark the mane is of this animal right here? Um, that animal is 
preferentially ex, uh, chosen by females, okay? If you have a blonde, like the blonde surfer dudes of California, no, okay? Females really like these dark main guys right here. They choose them uh, if they have a choice. And most of the time, as you, many of you have been to Africa, most of the time what you see in the predator action, if you don't turn on the Nature Channel or PBS specials or BBC, Planet Earth, this is what you see. You know, you see them sleeping in the trees because most 22 hours a day, they just rest. So it's very – and we can't do night drives in the parks that I go to in the Serengeti because the poachers come out at night. And so the park service has just said, hey, no night driving because then if something happens, we know that it's, uh, you know, not one of the tourists out there. Okay. Uh, and then there's the cheetah. Uh, the, the teardrop, they have a spotting pattern similar to um, um, a little bit like leopards, but they have these teardrops. And these, we used to have a cheetah. How many of you have ever seen pronghorn antelope in North America? Okay, you guys need to get out more. <laughs> they travel at 65 miles an hour, 60 to 65 miles an hour. <laughs> Why do they need to go so fast? Guess what? We used to have an American cheetah here that was that fast. And so this pronghorn antelope evolved the speed, which it now no longer needs because our cheetah is extinct. Uh, cheetahs have uh, what we call a genetic bottleneck. What I mean by that is during the distant past, and this is not something that humans did. This is just kind of just happened in nature. Um, their population got so depressed that there – and very few individuals gave rise to the rest of them – that there is basically no genetic differences between all the cheetahs in the entire planet, including all those in the zoos and all those found in India even. And they're so closely related that they can do skin grafts and not have the skin rejected. Uh, that's how close they are. So that's, a, that's really bad news for them. What that means is if there's a pathogen, if there's some kind of disease that goes through, there's not a lot of genetic diversity. Bad news. But the good news is we didn't do it. Okay, humans did not do it like they did with the elephant seals. Okay, there it is again. Hyenas. Okay, we're back to hyenas. How am I doing? Oh, two minutes. Okay, hyenas, Rodney Dangerfield. Okay, no respect. Uh, these are one of my favorite animals. At Lawrence uh, uh, Frank at UC Berkeley up on uh, Grizzly Peak Boulevard kept – captive cheetahs up there, and he was studying them. We learned a lot of great information from the ones he had in captivity. And I had a lady from Berkeley, uh, and we went out to Tanzania, and all of a sudden we heard, whoop, whoop, whoop. And she went, oh, my God, what's that? I said, that's a hyena. She goes, I've been hearing those for 10 years up in her house. She had no idea that they were, she, they were you know, that farms in Berkeley? <laughs> it was like hyenas in Berkeley. <laughs> there were, actually. Anyway, um, and here's my totem animal. Okay, which is the black-backed jackal, that, that animal right there. That's my favorite animal. Um, why? Good parent, really good parent, um, kind of handsome, you know, got a nice pelage, um, full of confidence. They'll steal food right out of the mouths of, of lions. Um, and, you know, they're just – when they walk, they, like, walk with confidence like they know where they're going. You know, I really like these animals, so that's my – I almost got killed by these twice in my career. This is the Cape Buffalo. Um, I won't go into the details of that, but both of them involved women, not surprisingly. Um, and uh, these and hippopotamuses are the ones that cause the most number of deaths in human beings in Africa, besides the mosquito carrying <coughs> malaria, quinine. Um, and uh, every day when they wake up, they're on the wrong side of the bed. And this is the second one that kills people, are hippopotamuses. I mean, it's interesting that you mostly get killed by vegetarians. So, <laughs> right? Because the hippo's a vegetarian, and so is the. Um, and here we're in the Angora Gora crater, uh, which some of you have been to. It's if you have one day left on the planet Earth and you like wild things, this is the place you need to spend it, is in the, the natural little uh, caldera uh, bowl, uh, where it's collapsed on itself, 2,000 foot elevation on the sides, and just this natural zoo, if you will. And here's the hippos again. And here's the rhinos. Rhinos, this is uh, black rhinos. These are highly endangered species. One of the few places you can see them is in the Angora Gora crater in and northern Tanzania, where they are protected. And they are, as Again, are uh, incredibly charismatic animals. They used to be once very widespread, but not so much anymore. Um, but the whole key for my trips are two things. One is the kinds of clients that I attract for whatever reason, irreverency, 
They like my sense of humor. They know that they can trust me and the, the trip choreography and the guides that I use. I hand pick the guides from Thompson Safaris. And I've been working with the same company since 1996. Um, and they do a superb job. And so each one of these individuals here, I've hand picked to lead my trips, to co-lead my trips. Really fantastic individuals. This, <laughs> this, is, this is my buddy, Micaiah, and uh, this is a Maasai guide, uh, guard, I should say, that I went to his house to visit him. And this is how we end up. This is the kind of place that we end up. Remember I talked about peak experience, okay? So we end up at this place called Gibbs Farm, which won this year, for the second year in a row, the number one luxurious place to stay in East Africa, you know? And so... He, Way back then in Momella, when there were like little rodents running around the room, there weren't really. Um, but that's past in the distant past. Now you remember this situation. So there we have the end of the slideshow. Ta da! Okay, bravo. <laughs> Spam bucket right here. Some of you, you know, people all over the world don't know that there actually is a spam. You know, I got this in Palau. <laughs> Michael, welcome to Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. What a great and fascinating talk. Did you, did you write a master's thesis? If so, what was it? No, I didn't. I was lazy. I just like nudibranchs. You guys know nudibranchs, the sea slugs, the beautiful butterflies of the sea. So I figured out a program I could do where all I had to do was to pass um, oral exams and written exams, and I'd get my master's degree. So I did not want to t have tunnel vision. You might have noticed that everything is connected. I love everything. And so I didn't want to get a master's. And the, it's funny, my professor said, he was trying to talk me into getting a PhD because he saw some, you know, talent or something. And he said, do you just want to be a consumer of information or do you want to produce information? Consuming's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Way too much work to produce information. So from the time you were a little boy, can you tell me? I what, still, still what am. Did, Good. You can, this is a good answer. What, what did you want to be when you were a five-year-old, six-year-old? and How did that progress? Army guy. Okay. How many of you wanted to be army guys when you were five? Yeah, right, exactly. I mean, you know, then later on you go, well, that's not so much fun. You could get killed. <laughs> and uh, then, but and I, that, no, I, I, I like nature. I think all children, young people, have an intrinsic love of being in the out of doors in nature. I think it's something that we're born with that we then lose. And so some of us just don't lose it. You know, we just keep it going. And I, you know, my parents were supportive. You know, they bought me a, a microscope and a telescope. And, and my father brought home a little vial that had a sealed properly that had um, black widow spider in it, you know. So I, we used to charge people five cents to look at the moon. You know, How and then I would you? charge them. I was eight years old, an entrepreneur, and later on, it was only that I looked back in time and went, "Oh <laughs> man, I realized I can make a living at this." <laughs> <laughs> what age were you when you decided you could make a living being a nature guide? It depends on your definition of living. Of a living, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, well, I had a little boy uh, mm -hmm. he, in 1986, and it was a real challenge to actually make this uh, profession work because my peer group, I you know, was born in 1951, they were all going to the Silicon Valley, and they were... It's okay. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Hugh, we, we, we could get him some new glass of whatever that yeah, was. Yeah, I have another one? Whatever that was. <laughs> And this time, put bitters in it. <laughs> Where was I? <laughs> they were all leaving for Silicon Valley. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And I was working on a place called Slide Ranch, which is north between Muir and Stinson Beach, uh, teaching urban kids the joys of milking goats and nature and things. And I thought that was a really good thing to do. And it was a, a way to gift to the community at large. But it was no way to make any money. Um, and, but I thought, you know, maybe if I put my eggs in a couple of different baskets and I worked for Oceanic Society, California Academy of Science, Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology, Marin Adventures College of Marin, and then I started a little business called Footloose Forays. And I figured if one of those baskets dropped, at least I had the other four baskets. So eventually, probably not until 1996 that I feel comfortable enough that I could actually make a living at this, you know. Then I stopped eating beans and rice. And how many forays a year do you conduct these days? Oh, I don't know. Um, my, both of my ex-wives told me exactly how many times <laughs> I've been out of the country. 
<laughs> but we're Which is you. actually true. <laughs> How many forays a year? Uh, you know, I really can't tell. I mean, uh, you know, it depends. Like, I have a regular Monday hiking group that goes on, you know, in spring and fall, and then I do trips. But I am having a – not me. My daughter-in-law is having a baby in the next week or two. So, yeah. How many of you are grandparents? Yay. So you know what that means. I'm going to be staying home a little bit more. So I'm going to only do trips now out of the country. My plan is uh, to Tanzania, which is one of my favorite places, and also Brazil, because Brazil, the Pantanal. I've done, have I done a talk? Yes. I did a talk yeah. on Brazil, um, yeah. Pantanal. So those are the two places that I'm going to continue to do until I can't do. And both of those places are the best wildlife shows left, one in Africa and the second one in South America is the Brazil, the Pantanal in particular. So. How long is a typical for it when you leave the country? One of those uh, two, weeks. Uh, two weeks. Two weeks is, you know, Two weeks approximately, maybe a little bit longer, but not much longer because then we start hearing the same stories again. Oh, okay, it's time to go there. <laughs> and how many guests will you bring? Uh, 16, 14 to 16. It depends on the trip. But, and how yeah. many guides? Uh, well, I always hire local guides because they're the ones that have the local knowledge. And also the idea is to um, generate some income in the host country so that they get the connection, the financial economic connection between the preservation of the natural resource and their financial well-being. Because the whole idea of this, if I looked at my carbon footprint, uh, as uh, all the people that fly to all the places that I've done trips, you know, I should feel really guilty. Um, and I do sometimes. But the idea is that if the people don't get the economic relationship between, you know, the, the, the world that they inhabit and live and their own financial well-being, they won't preserve it. So that's the idea for ecotourism, if you will. So I try to be really careful about the groups and organizations and sites that I use to make sure that they're culturally sensitive um, that the, they treat their staff right and that the money generated is – a lot of it is going to the local people so that they understand, you know, like I said, the relationship. So if you have 16 guests, how many, get, how many guides would you have on a trip like that? Um, well, that would be me, and I'm sort of the bridge between their world and the world. And then I would have – like for Africa, for example, I'd have four driver guides. So there would be four driver guides plus me. And uh, in uh, Africa – I mean in uh, uh, Brazil, it would be me and one other guy uh, basically. And well, I used to do trips to Bhutan, and I also – you know, it would be me and two other people. So – Approximately something like that. Yeah. So if you could be an animal in Africa, what animal would you be? <laughs> assuming you assume that humans are not. <laughs> yeah, what's really funny is there's this uh, Maasai guy that I see every year, and he's selling a natural Viagra, okay, which is a um, – it's actually the bark of an acacia tree. You know, I did some research when I got home because I bought some from him. You know, you never – I 67, okay. Um, I um, – I did some research on it. It's got some, you know, viability and stuff, and I've never, I'm not actually used it, uh, to be clear. Um, but uh, he said, it makes you like an impala. <laughs> Remember the impala with all the females around it? Like, okay, yeah, well, you know, it's kind of like, uh, what did, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, let's say, uh, you know, what's the definition of bigamy? One wife, too many. What's the definition of monogamy? Same thing. <laughs> Oscar Wilde, that's who said it. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so, but the animal that I would, um, it wouldn't be the impala. Um, I, it would be the blackback jackal, that one that I just showed. That's my totem animal. You know, that's the one I just mentioned. Why I would, would you want to be a black? What's, what's well, like I said like? before, it's, you know, monogamous, you know, which I like to think I am. Um, you know, a good parent, which I am, um, got a, you know, kind of nice dress, pelage, uh, full of confidence, self-confidence, which I, which I have, and always looks like when they're going someplace, they know exactly where they're going, so. <laughs> even if they don't. Talk to me about good parenting. You said animal with good parenting skills or habits or traits. Well, I mean, you know, you want to make sure that your offspring survives through adulthood. I guess that's the bottom line, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that they have babies. I mean, you know, we keep the bar really low. Like, they made it. They made it. They have babies. Okay, good. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and that's basically what it is. You know, just making sure that, you know, you take care of your young. And, you know, you know without getting to a lot of details, there's, you know, two different kind of ways to parent. One is called K-selected. One is R-selected. R-selected is, let's have a lot of babies and not pay much attention to them someone will make it you know that's okay <laughs> and case selected is let's just have a few and really work hard on making them to adulthood so human beings are case selected species you know uh 
Uh, Blackback jackals are case selected species. They have few young, but they put a lot of energy into them, and they're really good parents. So, what animals have terrible parenting skills? Fish. Fish. <laughs> <laughs> there goes that sperm. <laughs> no, I mean, not all fish, you know. I mean, there's some exceptions. But, you know, sometimes fertilization is, is, isn't even internal, you know. <laughs> like frogs, you know. Like, uh, you just lay your eggs over there, and then I'm going to put my milt. Can you imagine na being named milt? <laughs> yeah, tough. <laughs> it's like fish sperm, you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, so that's a, that's a good example of, you know, lousy parental care. So what animal would you at least want to be? <laughs> That's an easy one. A male spotted hyena. And I, I was once asked by um, uh, Packard, the Packard Foundation. They went to uh, Safari West up in Sonoma County, and they, went, they were doing a retreat. And I said, well, how many of the group are in the upper echelon are female? And they said, well, well actually, we have about 70%. I went, oh, great. I'll do, I know the animal to do. I'll do the spotted hyena. Spotted hyenas females are dominant over every single male in the group. Um, they are the ones that are in charge, except for the for the firstborn from the dominant alpha female. Other than that, the oldest males, no matter how long they've been in the group, is subordinate to little baby female spotted hyenas. So if you ask me what I did not want to be when I was reborn into a body in Africa, it would be a male spotted hyena because they are at the bottom of the biting order. Okay, that was the easy answer. So now I'm going to keep asking questions, but if you have one, please hold your hand up, and John will bring the mic to you. We love, and we love questions from the audience. <clears throat> um, so talk about social, uh, the social structure in animals. Um, you know, sisterhood, matriarchal. <laughs> what you're saying? Sisterhood. Okay, so African elephants, black-faced vervet monkeys. Spotted hyenas and African elephants all have sisterhoods. And what I mean by that is that when the females are born into the group, they don't leave. Okay? They create a, a very powerful bonding with the other females in the group. Okay, in all of those cases that I just described. The males, on the other hand, there's a number of male mammals I wouldn't want to be in Africa now that I think about it besides the hyenas. But most of the males, about the time they become sexually precocious, they're driven from the natal group, okay? And they have to go and make their way into the adjacent group and maybe get accepted. And a lot of them are the ones that are, like, taken, you know, they're the ones that are killed by predators because they no longer have that structural, that social network, that support that they once existed when they were like little babies and youngsters. But now they've got to go out on their own. So that's, that's it. And then there's zebras, which have what we call harems. And the, there's a stallion, which is dominant in that group. Uh, well, I, I didn't talk about mountain gorillas, cause, but I do trips to Uganda, or I did trips to Uganda <clears throat> and Rwanda, and they have a whole different social group as well. But basically, it's the sisterhood is kind of one of the themes of some of the most successful mammals in Africa. So what animals have a bro culture? Or talk to one where there's good, strong male bonding. Oh, that's, a good, that's a really good question. Um, I would say uh, some of the mammals, the males that have to leave their natal group, then bond with other males. For example, African elephants will hang out with each other, you know, and it'll be like, yeah, they'll be buddies and stuff, and they'll be, be spending a certain amount of time together in a group. And when the, uh, when the males get to be, when male elephants get to be old, um, probably a lot of you know this, they go through six sets of molars, and so the very last molar group is why they die. It's, you know, they live to 50 or 60 years old, and they're on their last set of teeth, essentially. So all the males sort of gather in, in uh, swampy areas with soft vegetation to talk about. Look at old age when we used to be able to eat grass <laughs> and tree bark and stuff and yeah it was really good back then um and so th those guys sort of hang out with each other and they have connections and they have friendships and stuff that that last through time <laughs> we recognize we resemble those remarks <laughs> yeah exactly uh and the other the other group that does that is actually baboons 
baboons are uh, of the groups in that in that part of Africa that I go to are the ones that closely have the, a similar sort of social construct to human beings. You know, the females sometimes have favorite uh, males they like to mate with, and they're friends with benefits. And then sometimes they're just males that are friends with them. I mean, they're just buddies, and they hang out together. And the same is true with a lot of the, the male baboons. You know, they'll grow up together. Um, and if, if there's a dominant male baboon, which there often is, um, uh, Robert Sapolsky, I'm not pronouncing Sapolsky. Sapolsky, you know, at Stanford has writ written. Oh, he's he's such a great speaker and a great writer and stuff. Have you had him here? No, you should have. Good him idea, here. good I mean, suggestion. Yeah, he's great. He looks like Albert Einstein's got a hair out here and beard out to here. There's a face in there somewhere, um, but he's very <laughs> he's he's even more entertaining than me. I know it's hard to believe, but. <laughs> um, but um, he talks a lot about, he studied baboons a whole lot, and he talks about the bonding and the friendship that the males have and how essential that is. And, uh, you know, uh, us males, at least those aware males, a lot of us in the Bay Area, um, realize how important those male uh, friendships are. Um, and those male friendships are super important in the baboon society as well. And if you're one of those alpha, alpha males that's been whooping up on every other male during, in, in, the, in the Congress, in the troop, um, when those guys get old, they get the crap beat out of them. I mean, all these other guys go, yeah, I remember you, you know, and so <laughs> they actually drive them out. You know, you feel a little sorry for them because they'll be isolated from the group. And these are social animals, you know, and so there'll be this guy. You know, he peaked. He was like the high school quarterback, <laughs> you know, that was with a cheerleader. OK, but it would have been better to be one of those kind of nerdy guys, you know, than some good friends. <laughs> Bill Gates. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, so they'll you know, those guys will be driven from the natal group. So I don't know if I, I think I answered that question. Again, if you have a question for the audience, John will bring you the mic, uh, and I'll keep asking while we uh, get mics out there. Um, most scared moments, or give us a couple of scared moments oh. in Africa. Oh. Hmm. Uh, yeah, well, let's see. Yeah, it was probably, there were two Cape Buffalo incidences. Uh, the last one was about three or four years ago, when I uh, had a sweetie pie, and I was growing up to this one rock outcropping where the the cell phone service could actually work in far off Arusha. And uh, as, I, as I started to walk up there, I said to the local guys, uh, has Harry been up? And Harry was one of the, this is in my private camp that they set up just for me. And there'd been some imbogos, that's the Kiswahili word for these solitary or uh, male Cape buffaloes that are sort of isolated from the whole group and they are not very friendly. Um, and I said, has Harry been up? And Harry is a guy that did Muhammad Ali jump rope on top of this copies. And they said, no, no. And then as I'm walking, one of them just said, Mbogo. And I went, oh, Mbogo? And, uh, and as I started to walk up, I heard coming from the left uh, hooves. You know, it's one of those. And before the, the reptilian stem just took over. And uh, so I ran as fast as I could downhill because this this Cape Buffalo was charging through the bushes. There was no impediment to this, to this animal at all. This is like a, you know, 1,500 pound animal heading at me. And I had been clapping my hands, which is what we did to, you know, let leopards and lions and elephants know we were nearby. I'd been clapping my hands. And usually that scares things away. Um, and in this case, instead of scaring this animal away, my friend Charles told me later, one of the local guides, it, it was like he couldn't see what it was. So he thought it could be an enemy. His lions are the main enemies. So instead of like fleeing, he came charging right at me. Um, and so and it's really interesting that when you have a situation like that, all everything becomes super, you know, enlightened, aware, whatever. And I realize, okay, I got to get out of here really fast. But n not even thinking that, right? Just responding. And so I ran down a little bit of the hill, and then I got behind one of the staff tents. Okay, I, I, I must confess, I, did. I thought, oh shit, he's got to go through that tent before he gets me. I hope nobody's in there. But <laughs> 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 you know, they shouldn't be in there. But I was thinking, I wasn't really thinking about anybody else. You know. What <laughs> it was like, how am I going to live through this little experience? So I ran down through the, um, you know, behind the tent, and I'm thinking, okay, he's got to go through that tent before he gets to me. And then he just charged off to the, and by this time, all of the staff came running out. Um, and, you know, they, they were looking at me like, uh, uh, you know, uh, Mazunga is the Kiswahili word that means white person, you know. And so I, I said, oh, wow, that was really close. I guess I'll go. And I, I, I excuse my language. Well, no, I probably shouldn't say that. Um, but I thought, at least I'm not 
dead yet. Um, you know, and I thought, I'll go make the phone call. And they looked at me like, what? <laughs> I said, well, I wasn't dead, you know, so that went off that way. I went off this way. So that was pretty close. So how close was he when he started charging you? How many feet? It's hard to tell, but closer than the, the bar, uh-huh. you know, closer We're than the bar. say that's 30 feet. Okay. Yeah, closer than that, because we looked at the vegetation later and the trees were, I mean, the bushes were just crushed, you know, so he was coming right at me. And when I went this way, he went that way. So that was... Uh, you know, that was the end of that story. And, uh, you know, then there was a couple of c- cases where I've been charged by hippos in Botswana, uh, and they wouldn't take American Express. <laughs> <laughs> uh, question in the audience from Joy Siegel. Joy. Hi, Joyce. Joy. Fasc- fascinating talk. Um, I think I know the answer to this, but if we can't make it to Africa, if we can't, oh, <laughs> make it to Africa... Can we see any of these animals in the local zoos? Well, I think the uh, Safari West up in uh, – they, they only have one predator. So if you like to see animals that kill other animals, you might have to go to the San Francisco Zoo. The San Diego Zoo as well um, and uh, Safari West up in Santa Rosa would be the two places – or three places that I would go. I don't know what – it's hard once you've seen the animals in the wild to go to a zoo. I know there's a, there is something um, – important about zoos and you know but what is more important is to preserve habitat not individual species and stuff so if people can generate monies for habitat preservation and actually to be honest with you what i tell people when they say what what can i do to improve the world i say empower women and so every every place i go i say here is the global fund for women Here's the money. Once you give women control over their finances and their bodies, the population um, gr- growth decreases Im- immediately. And so it, ultimately that's what the most important thing is. I, I hate to say it, but it's to give – well, I don't hate to say it. It's the truth. Is to give women power in the developing world. And once you do that, then the, the, the birth rate decreases um, and, and it just becomes a better world actually. So forget – Charismatic species, I mean, you might want to donate to something for that. But basically, the ultimate thing is let's empower women. You know, that's it. Uh, come on. How about a round of applause on that one? <laughs> <laughs> David. Yes, David. I, I actually was going to ask you a question about the water buffalo and the hippos. Cape. You, you just went through the Cape Buffalo, and mm-hmm. you just went through and answered those. So um, I had a couple of other extraneous questions. Was, the, uh, was the, the bark that you were talking about, was that Yohimbe? You mean the scientist? It was it was a an acacia. I don't know what species it is, but but I I, I still have some at home. If you want to try it, David's my good friend right here. So. <laughs> did and then um, did they put enough bitters in your drink this time? Yes, <laughs> they did. It's perfectly made. Actually, I could not ask for a better gin and tonic to prevent the malaria that may be attacking me at this very moment. <laughs> I'm wondering if they might have put some of the extract of that bark in there as well. It's kind of a dark color. I'll let you know a little bit later. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the great talk today. Oh, yeah. Amazing. You're welcome. You're welcome. So talk to us about video. poachers in Africa. Okay. When I was there, well, I was there every year, um, uh, the helicopter flew over. And um, I thought, wow, look at that helicopter. You know, we don't see that very often. A day later, we found out that was an English pilot that was shot down by poachers in um, right in a place that we go uh, from uh, rhino poachers. Uh, unfortunately, the the demand – well, China – the demand for ivory in China was fueling a huge increase in the poaching of elephants, um, not, not rhinos, but elephants. And China uh, recently enact, uh, shut down some of the um, carving factories that existed. And what's happened with the rise of the middle class in China is the demand for uh, ivory has gone up because now they can afford it from some of the traditional things that they do. Um, and we're hoping that China enforces the laws if they do. And by the way, I, you know, San Francisco is one of the primary places, Chinatown, where illegal ivory moves through. It's not like all over there, over there, over there. It's like right here. 
Um, and so the key is to stop the demand. Um, the guy on the street, I mean, you know, I have to have empathy for people that are barely getting by. I mean, you think about it. Okay, you're trying to survive in Africa and you want to f feed your family and you realize that if you get this tusk from this animal that your family is taken care of for the rest of their lives and maybe even beyond that because of the price. So what you have to do is you have to stop the demand, not the guy right there poaching. Okay, that's important too. But the demand, you have to start there. And so hopefully... Um, China will um, enforce um, the closure of those carvings, the factories that carve that. And if the demand stops, then the po illegal poaching will decrease. And to be uh, good news is it's actually showing up and is the, the level of poaching has dropped uh, pretty good and uh, pretty well in, uh, in Tanzania now and Botswana as well and Namibia for that matter. Yes, Julia, we have a question on Facebook Live. Actually not a question but a comment because mm – -hmm. We get lights all the way throughout the the the, uh, the program, and we're delighted to have it. But when we got the best thing you can do is empower women, we had fifty. <laughs> <laughs> all righty then. I know. yeah. Well, I can be charming if I want to. I know. <laughs> so, what are your language skills? None. So, when you're over there, you use translators all the time. Yeah, I mean, I get I, I get better. You know, <laughs> no, I hire local people for a bunch of reasons. One is, um, you know, obviously, as I said, the, the, the transfer of wealth from the north to the south is important. Uh, but also, you know, you know, they speak, they can speak both languages and I, I can't. I mean, I know a few words, but it's not, that's not my skill set. So I don't even try. What about weaponry? Do you take any weaponry, guns or like that on forays? My hula hoop. That's it? Yeah, in case something happens, I can hoop, right? And then they'll go, what? <laughs> uh, no, you, you're not allowed to, I mean, you know, there's a couple of walks. I mean, it depends on the trips. Like, like, I, like I said, I used to go to Botswana, South Africa, Madagascar, and, and different trips have different, I mean, different countries have different uh, criteria. In, uh, in uh, Tanzania, however, you're not allowed to have weapons. Uh, the only people with weapons are the guards that have to do with the national park. So there's three uh, times that I have the ability to do a walk, and we have to have an armed guard with us all the time. And most of the time you look at that 22 caliber, and it's just going to – it's like you might as well have a firecracker, you know what I mean? Um, and th they very seldom have to use them, and um, so, you know, that's not a concern uh, too much. But, you know, the animals don't look at human beings as a food item. There's plenty of other things to eat, so they don't see – See, at least in Tanzania, they don't see us as something to eat. And, and they just kind of glaze over the look of the safari vehicles. You know, they don't associate safari vehicles with something to eat. So it's not really a concern or problem. Have you ever, including as a child, gone hunting? Yeah, I used to hunt um, dove and squirrels. Um, what age? Oh, I was probably 11 to 17. With a 22? Uh, yeah, or, or Dove, you know, I had a 20-gauge shotgun, 16-gauge, or 12-gauge, too, but that hurt my shoulder as a little mm -hmm. kid, so, yeah. So, um, if you were going to spend one day in Africa, your last day, where would you go? What would you uh, do? I'd go to the Ngorogoro Crater, that place that I mentioned. That's a, a collapsed caldera, 10, 10, uh, 10 miles in diameter, drops down 2,000 feet. Uh, it's kind of a natural bowl. Uh, looks like, a, and the animal. It's the greatest concentration of predators left on the planet Earth is down there. Uh, there's 470 hyenas. There's 300 um, African elephants, and there's a whole bunch of game down in there. And there's uh, recently showed up was caracals, which is really exciting. So that would be the one place that I would spend actually uh, in Gorgor. If you like wild things, that'd be the place. Either that or New York City, one of them. So, what animal sounds do you like to make? That's the hyena. What are they saying? I'm here, I'm here, where are you, where are you? I'm right here, I'm right here. <laughs> I do have a story about hyenas for the first time. So there were these hyenas and they were like, they were eating our, like our kerosene lanterns, you know, they're just, and they were outside and I was at the beginning of my safari experience, you know, it was 1993 or something. And, you know, and it's like, I know people are scared because there's all these hyenas out here and I'd just been reading about them and it said, hyenas, spotted hyenas, craven cowards. You know, so I went, all right, okay, I'm going to go out and scare them away. You know, so then I reached up and, you know, to grab my zipper of my tent and because they were right outside. I, I started to pull it down, and then about halfway down I went, what does craven actually mean? <laughs> <laughs> does craven mean 
they aren't really cowards. <laughs> 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 and I wasn't, that was long before I could check things, you know? So it's like, I think I'll just sip that thing. <laughs> and later I found out Craven does mean I could have gone out, but by that time they were already gone. So, <laughs> so if I uh, bring the mic to uh, this guy. I don't need the mic. I speak loud. We need, uh, we need the mic. Okay, we You're, need the mic. Yeah. Uh, when I was in Africa many years ago, I found that both eland and zebra were delicious. What is your favorite animal to eat? <laughs> Great question. Thank you. Well, and that's a good point, you know, because there are, uh, for example, eland, like the Maasai, for example, um, <laughs> this cracks me up, um, the great one gave the Maasai all the cows. So Wait, wait, you said the great one gave? The spirit, the great spirit. Okay, okay. Okay, I mean, I just, uh -huh, yeah, right. I want to okay. be. You know, yeah. Uh, thank yes, you, thank right. you. That was the word I was looking for. Um, so when they steal cows from the neighboring group, they're not stealing them; they're just returning them to the rightful owner. You know, so the Maasai um, are one of the few groups of people that have are relatively compatible with wildlife because they don't look at the wildlife as anything to eat. Okay, except for elands, because elands taste so much like cows that they make an exception for the elands, okay? And in South Africa, for example, now they have eland farms, so they're raising some wild game as well. And then so every once in a while, some of the lodges allow game to be served. And I remember being at uh, uh, one of the lodges on the edge of the crater, and there was this poor Maasai young man who was being trained as a waiter, which when you think about where he comes from and what he's doing right now is kind of amusing. So I had a friend of mine on the trip who um, said, uh, so what do you recommend with warthog? Which was, <laughs> this poor guy is like, warthog. And then he proceeded to name every single wine that they actually had on the list. It was not a recommendation. It was a, you know, he just named every single wine. And so uh, my friend finally chose a fine South African Merlot, which apparently if you have warthog again, the Merlot goes really well with warthog. <laughs> <laughs> Michael is a naturalist and pairing specialist. <laughs> yes, another question from the audience. Hi, I'm Helen from China. Uh, very impressive uh, talk. Although my English is not that good enough to follow you because you uh, uh, speak very fast. Uh, I think, uh, I, but I really enjoy the talk. I think I will uh, uh, tell Mr. C that enforce the law <laughs> soon. <laughs> okay. My question for Michael is: uh, What motivates you for? To, in, to persist for uh, such uh, so many years for a dream uh, in this wild world, I think it's really uh, very difficult for lots of people for us. And, and w do you have hope? And what's your hope for in the future? And what's your dream? So, yeah, thank you. I think that was very articulate, don't you? <laughs> What'd you say? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> no, those are those are excellent questions. I appreciate I appreciate them, um, and I am from Tennessee, so maybe I'll start talking a little bit slower. Um, <laughs> first of all, from my point of view, it, nature puts you in the moment. Okay experiencing something like I just a second ago I didn't want to point it out, but well, okay, look at those brown pelicans flying right there. Yeah. Okay, so look at, look at uh, diving right there and, and just, and this beautiful place that we're looking at right now. All of us want to be engaged in the present, you know. That is the gift of being alive, is not thinking about the future, not reflecting on the past, okay. And so nature in something is something that brings you into the, into the moment, okay. And so that's been the driving force behind me because that is one of the ways in which you can be totally present. There's nothing else going on when you see, for example, the, or you're sitting there listening to elephants vocalizing near, near you. And, you're, and that's another thing I forgot to mention. On my trips, I, I was going to say I enforce. I invite people to be quiet and to be still. I have a bunch of things that I have to share, so do my local guides, but the way that you really get things into your heart somatically is to still your voice, 
your monkey mind, to be quiet and to feel that somatically, if you will. And Africa is an easy place to do that because it's so remarkable. It's so are those brown pelicans flying right across right there. And so we only have our moments, right? That's all we have. And so, you know, the, my invitation is to be present, as present as you possibly can. There's not much that we can do about the future. There's not much we can do about the past. But we can be in, in the moment, whatever that happens to be. And so for me, doing natural history trips and going with kindred spirits, people that feel I feel connected to and that feel connected to me and that love each other. I mean, I forget, I've got like, not that I'm advertising this, but 14 relationships which have started from people that have met. And there's two divorces, so, you know, I'm still... I'm still batting, you know, pretty good. Um, uh, but, I, and to be honest with you, I don't have a lot of hope for a lot of preservation of what we have, but we're here, you know, you're here, and this is what we have, you know, and so if you can land in it fully, you know, that's all we can do, you know, and of course I tithe to different organizations, I write the letters, I do all the things that I can do, but I try not to let that weight on me, you know, not to feel the burden of that, because I just got this one life. This is it, and that's all of, all of us have is this one life. So how are we going to be as fully in it and joyful in it as we can without, you know, ignoring what's really going on? I don't know if that answered the question or not, but... Great. Uh, social structure, Michael. Talk about species with interesting social structure. Look at these. <laughs> yeah, human beings, clearly. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, I don't in know. Africa. I mean, you know, I, I talked about baboons. I talked about elephants, you know, uh, hyenas. Uh, you what about know. the safety of the flock? Uh, yeah, the I mean, it's all, it's all good to hang out together in case, when, you know, some predator sees, I mean, some prey item sees something else so that you can communicate that really effectively to one another, to each other in the group. So they stay in the middle. It's safer in the middle of the flock. <laughs> yeah, especially if you're a little dominant, you know, you get, the, you get to be in the middle of the group, not on the periphery. You know, often it's the, it's the adolescent males that are on the edge. <laughs> I don't want to be an adolescent male either. So how is a trip to Burning Man like one to Africa? Full of wildlife, <laughs> unexpected treats. <laughs> Nobody's wearing clothes. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Maybe that should be your next program. <laughs> Burning Man. <laughs> so after you go on one of these trips, Michael, how do you decompress when you come back to, to your home, ah, California, Petaluma? I think about that, uh, Santa Rosa. Um, I take my shoes off. I go in the backyard. I plant my feet on the ground. I try to eat something out of my garden. And I go, I'm home. You know, that's exactly what I do. Because, I mean, this sounds a little new age, but hey, I've been in the Bay Area for a long time. Um, <laughs> these rubber soles that we've developed since the 1960s have interfered with some discharge, some electrical discharge from our bodies. There's some interesting good science about that. And so what I found in order to, you know, be connected with where I live is I actually physically take my shoes off and go barefooted in, in my backyard and go, oh, I'm home. This is what home feels like. So, Are you a morning person? Give us a day in the life a couple of days after you've been back. What do you do to get... Well, after you've been back, if you've been 12 hours off, it's like 3 o'clock. All right, I can do lots of things now at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> um, so time zone issues? Oh, of course. Yeah, I like to think that I've totally adapted to it, but I haven't. Um, but, you know... Ambient, exercise, coffee, you know, that's kind of the, you know, I don't do the blue light thing that people do. Um, and, uh, yeah. And so after you're Oh, fully CBDs. That's new. I've discovered that. That, that works. CBDs. Uh, what do they stand for? Um, cannabinoids. Cannabinoids. Stuff with marijuana that doesn't have THC in it. It, it helps me to get a good night's sleep. So, uh -huh. yeah. And so after you're back and acclimated to being back in the Bay Area, how early do you get up? Give us a day in the life. You, you know, doing? I have what I think Stanford Sleep Clinic calls morning insomnia. So my brain will start working at 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning, and it won't stop working. And finally I go, okay, all right, you want to get up? You're getting up right now. So I have, um, you know, I get up early in the morning. It's my favorite time, actually. I, I don't mind getting up. It's like I'm a morning person, though, for sure. And what, do, what, do, what websites do you look at? What do you like for websites? I try not to look at any. 
Um, I've tried to just go outside and ride my mountain bike. Um, you know, that's the main thing I do for exercise, and I try to get out in nature, and I try not to look at websites because I have to do enough of that as it is for my business. Um, I do like Atlas Obscura. I don't know if you guys know that uh, website, Atlas Obscura. It kind of has all the strange things on the planet Earth. Um, you know, anyway, I, I, that's kind of fun to look at, but I try not to look at it. I try, to, I try to get off the computer as much as I can. What can we learn from animals? Give us a couple lessons. There's a great little uh, documentary called My Life as a Turkey. Uh, anybody see that? It sounds weird, but okay. I Put that on your list, My Life as a Turkey. And trust me, watch this. This guy raised, raised uh, hatched some turkey eggs, and he became, the turkeys became imprinted on him. And uh, it, it was what he learned from being a parent of a bunch of turkeys. Uh, sounds bizarre, and it is, and it's really great. Um, so that's one thing he learned from animals. And he was a scientist. He was a researcher. And uh, basically back to being in the moment, that's what it was. It was being in the moment. Michael Ellis, naturalist. It's wonderful having you as a guest at the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the St. Francis Yacht Club. Thank you so much. And with that, the luncheon is adjourned. <laughs>